in Concord Baptist Church Bible Study Youth Night. Do you uh, want to pray? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead, Noah. Thank you, Father, for this night. Thank you that we all get together here and uh, fellowship and learn more about you, Lord. Thank you for protecting everyone on their way over here and protect everyone on their way home tonight. Lord, uh, this is a great night. Keep protecting us from the virus. And your great ship in my prayer. Amen. 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 All right. Brother Tim. Yes, sir. <laughs> Olas. I can't remember what page it was. 236. Okay, thank you. All right. Good evening, Concord Baptist Church. No. All right, please stand and turn to page 236. We got a bumblebee in the room. Yeah. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. Ding. 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 Ready? Congaree National Swamp or the monument. Hey, Ben. Y'all want to go one Saturday? Sure. Yes. Yes. What is it? It's uh, over towards uh, Eastover. It's uh, used to be Congaree National Monument. Now they made it a park. You know, they have camp and they got a, uh, I forget the name of the center there where you can go in and watch the movies and stuff. And it's one of the oldest. Uh, bottom lands that they have in the southeast anymore and they got some big old trees and they got a two mile boardwalk and they got some 20 some mile uh trails if you want to hike the trails and all but i've got this book on the forgotten ways and plants that are edible and stuff like that and i thought it might be fun to go down there one saturday and 
and start looking for some of these plants. And then trying to identify them. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So you can eat in your backyard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yard lettuce and stuff like that, painkillers. Yeah. You know. That stuff's better. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that'd be something worth doing one Saturday. Uh, we'll check the weather and find a nice day. Oh crap. In the fifties, but uh. Anyway, if you got your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter ten. Me, Pastor? No, Sir? Romans. Romans chapter 10. Mm-hmm. Keep praying for my wife, if you will, to get better. Uh, you know, I keep praying, and sometimes you wonder why God doesn't answer prayer. Uh, but he does answer it. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes it's wait. I remember somebody by the name of Daniel in my Bible. The Lord said he heard him the first day that he started praying. It was 21 days later of faithful praying. Amen. amen. When he was visited. And he was a godly man. Amen. But uh, tonight I want to look at some things. One thing that I used to hate as a preacher is I've seen people come to church after 20, 30, 40 years of living like a devil and uh, saying, I want to rededicate my life. And I remember my dad saying that. Now, me and my dad, we, when I was lost, we, were, we did a lot of trucking together out to the Midwest and all. And we partied together. We drank and, you know, you name it, fight. Uh, I remember one day we were sitting in a bar with uh, his cousins and myself. We were sitting around the table out there between Uniontown and Macetown, Pennsylvania at a little bar. At a round table, and we were drinking Iron City beer. And uh, my dad's father, my grandfather, was a deacon in the Mennonite Church in Masontown, Pennsylvania. And I brought a lot of reproach on his name. Uh... I got into it one night in a bar up there, and they had me down at the magistrate's court, and they wanted me to put up some money. I said, let me out on my own reconnaissance or put me in jail. I don't care which. And uh, so they brought this other guy in there, and he says, just pay the fine. I said, shut up, fat boy. Ain't nobody talking to you. And uh, we started to break out in there, and, of course, they stopped us, and my uncle came in, and he put in a word for me and all since they knew my family and all. And they let me out. And uh, But anyway, we're sitting at this bar, and in between that, uh, shame to say, I stabbed a man eight times with a Phillips screwdriver. I promised him I'd take his eyes out, and the only thing I got was his cheek, his ear, and six in the back. And But uh, it wasn't, that was my lost days. And uh, my dad looked over at me. He looked at his beer. I still see him today. He slid it over to the middle of the table like that, and he said, I've had enough. He saw me getting worse than him. And I know he loved me enough, you know, that he didn't want to see me go that way. And so years later, when I got saved, I prayed for my dad for 12 years. Every time he'd come by in his truck, and I got off the road to be in Bible school and all, but when he, uh, he'd come by the house and he'd, visit and he'd go on up the hill from the house we're at now with the with the truck and I'd stand in the middle of the road at night as I watched the taillights go away and just start weeping and I'd pray for him and my dad come around a little bit and he said he's going to rededicate his life and I said what are you going to rededicate 40 years of drunkenness and fighting and gambling and, and everything is that what and my dad was a tough man many times I've seen Five or six guys try to take them. And uh, anyway, long story short, I prayed and prayed, and my dad got saved, became one of the most faithful church members we had here up until he died. 
Amen. But he grew up in the Mennonite church and they went off to Christian camps and all this stuff. And what they do, now they believe that you don't have eternal security. They, they have the Armenian form of salvation, which you can lose it, and then you can get it back, and you can lose it, and you can get it back. The Calvinists, they, Calvinist form of doctrine is you got no say so in it. You're either in or you're out. Hey, Ben, that's a lie too. Damnable lie. But uh, when my dad was young, he prayed a prayer. And I hate it when these preachers try to, like, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't like altar calls. Because some people, uh, they, they want to get them to come up, but yet their pride won't let them. And then they, if God was dealing with them, then they miss it. Amen. Because they put that pride there and they put it off. Or they get them to come up, especially young children, seven, eight, nine years old. And uh, they say, you don't want to go to hell when you die, do you? Wouldn't you like to go to heaven when you die? Why don't you just pray and ask Jesus into your heart? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, Jesus, please come into my heart. Where's Jesus live? Here? And for the next 40 years, they lived like a devil. They got religion. Amen. And so I want to preach and teach a little bit tonight on religious but lost. Amen. Religious but lost. I made uh, a few professions myself. I was, uh, when I was young, about nine years old, I found a Bible where it said I asked Jesus into my heart. I knew that Jesus was God, but I never knew that he is God. I knew he was the son of God, and I just knew that if I did good and asked Jesus to save me, I'd go to heaven. But if I messed up and did bad, then I'd die and go to hell. So I lived my life like that, and when I got real religious, I'd do good. Then it'd slip away, and I'd get out there with the guys, doing, getting into sin, things I didn't need to get into. And I said, well, if I lose it, hopefully I'll live through it and I can get saved again. Isn't that crazy? But I really believed that. I didn't know any better. I thought every church was going to heaven. I even thought the Pope was saved. <laughs> Amen. And so I went through a, Another profession when I went in the Marine Corps. I think everybody gets saved to boot camp. If nothing else, just to go to church to get away from the DI for a couple hours. And I remember a song we had in the hymnal there, the old rugged cross. And I was homesick. I'd weep at night. You didn't tell nobody. But you'd weep at night homesick. And I'd tear that song page out of the hymnal and I kept it with me. As soon as I got out of boot camp, I was a big, bad Marine. You know, 21st Psalm. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for I'm the baddest so-and-so in the valley. <laughs> That's what they taught us. <laughs> and uh, so I went through that. As soon as I got out, boy, I was right out there with the rest of the gang. Fighting, drinking, you name it. Amen. And one day I'm down in Fairburn, Georgia, picking up a load of fuzz. If you don't know what fuzz is, that's the Pink Panther insulation from Owens Corning. And I'm down there in Fairburn getting a load. And this Church of God preacher is going to take these witnesses into this other guy. Church of God believes you can lose it too. But anyway, I said, well... He said they were going over to Waffle House to get something to eat. I said, well, come on, we'll take my truck. I said, I'm hungry too. So on the way over there, he's talking to this guy, and I'm listening. I said, well, I believe in God. He said, you do? I said, yeah. He said, you sure don't sound like it. I said, why? He says, every other word out of your mouth is a cuss word. I never realized it. We just talked that way. You know, that's why I can have a lot of patience with most people that I hear cursing. It's because I didn't realize that I cursed like that. 
You imagine how much longer I probably could have lived if I just saved that breath instead of cursing? <laughs> <laughs> so we get to the Waffle House and I got the trucker belt on, you know, that I had custom made lanky Frankie across the back, you know, with some roses on it. And I had this real bad belt buckle, which we won't go into that. And I'm sitting there across from this guy witnessing to this fellow and he looks over at me. He says, can you cover that up? I said, what? He said, that buckle. I said, oh, yeah, I can cover it up. <laughs> it was a nasty belt buckle. And uh, so anyway, we get done eating and everything, and we leave, and I get under my load and head back here. And I'm on I-20 on the other side of Augusta about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'm arguing with myself. And I said, my life's out of control. I said, I'm going to lose my wife, my children, my home, my business, the way I was going. I couldn't continue on that. And I, I had this much sense, though. I said, Lord, I can't handle my life. I said, I need somebody to take charge of my life. I knew that. And the devil, he's slick. I sat there with my pale males. And I said, should I, shouldn't I? Should I, shouldn't I? Finally, I threw my cigarettes out the window. Because if you smoked, you're lost. That's what I was taught. So I pulled over on the side of the road there on I-20. And I got out of the truck. And I grabbed that, what they call a Bible, the living Bible. My wife's copies over there. Over in 1 Samuel, it says, Saul boiled in his rage and said, you son of a. That's what it says. And I can show it to you right there if you want to see it. But uh, I got out with that Bible. And see, the reason I believe the King James Bible is God's infallible, inerrant words. Because Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's a little less spirit. So with that Bible comes his spirit because he is the word. Did not the Bible say, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwell among us. Amen. And so that Bible has a spirit that goes with it. And so do those other Bibles. The spirit of Antichrist. Now, I got out with that living book, or Bible they called it. I got down on my knees on the side of the road about 4.30 in the morning now. And I asked Jesus to come to my heart. I'm telling you, it's like he lifted this building off of my shoulders. I cannot explain to you the feeling that came. I mean, it was the most wonderful feeling I've ever had in my life. Just like somebody just lifted something off me. I got home about 6 o'clock in the morning, back to trucking, and my wife was always the religious one. She's the one that took the kids to Sunday school and church. And I backed my truck in between the houses down there, and I went in, and I said, Guess what? I got saved. She said, good, go to sleep. I'm tired. Well, I'd really, you know, <laughs> took the fuzz out of the fuzz. Eh? But, and, uh, <laughs> so the next thing you know, I changed my handle from Lanky Frankie the Keener Wiener to the Forgiven Sinner. I paint a big old cross up on the top of my truck on the air deflector with blood drops hanging down and put my handle up there, Forgiven Sinner. I joined the Southern Baptist Church. I started doing Sunday school classes. Man, I was into it. I wanted to learn how to speak in an unknown tongue. <laughs> so I stopped. I was in a truck stop down in Atlanta, Truck Stops of America, and I got me a room, and I went in there, and one of these charismatics were on the television and said, if you want to speak in an unknown tongue, repeat after me. So I said, blah, 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 blah. And I, said, I don't know what I said, but this feeling came over me. I had a spirit, a real spirit. But you know what? I had the wrong spirit. Three years later, after I left there, I was on a missionary trip. We were passing out gospel tracts, island hopping through the Caribbean, knocking on doors, street preaching. And on the way back, I got saved. I got under Holy Ghost conviction. 
we were, it was April 30th, 1983. And the only reason that I remember that is because of my wife's birthday. And Brother John asked with, we were in a private plane, Cherokee 6, six seat plane. I was in the middle seat, right behind the pilot, facing the tail section. <laughs> and this scrawny, blonde haired, skinny street preacher was preaching at me. And I said, well, I don't smoke or chew or go with girls that do. He says, I don't care how good you are. You're still immoral. And he said a few other things. And I'm under conviction, but I didn't know what conviction was. I just knew I just wanted to reach out and touch somebody. I wanted to grab him by a scrawny little neck and stick my thumbs right into his Adam's apple and just squish it. I'm telling him to shut up. And he said, no. And I looked out the right window of the plane. I'm sitting on a Cherokee 6. It's a Piper Cherokee. Got a side door right there. We just took off from Jacksonville after fueling up. And we're flying over. Like I said, it's April 30th. It's springtime. I looked out the window and looked down. I could see the Savannah River snaking through the trees. And it was all green, all trees. It was a swamp forest area. And this is all going on. And this little voice says, I turned around and looked at the altimeter like that over the pilot's shoulder. Said we were at 5,600 feet. I turned back around. This little voice in my head says, why don't you just jump? It'll be all over. Just think you could just float down. And it looked like carpet down there. And I reached for the handle. And all of a sudden, it's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and everybody shut up, and I was under conviction, didn't know that it was conviction. We get over to Eagle Aviation, land the plane. They're unloading the plane. I go in, and I squat down next to the water fountain. And I'm thinking, if I got to be as good as God to get to heaven, and the Bible says in James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. And the Bible says we're all liars. And it says to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. We've never done that. We might think we have, but we haven't done that. And I said, Lord, if I'm going, how do I? I said, if I'm going, you got to take me. There's no other way. But I said, Lord, if I got to be as good as you to get to heaven, how am I going to get there? I mean, this is a battle going on inside. And a verse that my pastor and I had argued over for months. You can ask Miss Randall. But Pastor Randall kept saying, whose faith is that in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I said, that's my faith. He said, no, that's the faith of Christ. And that's why in Galatians chapter 2, it says, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. Of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It said that he saved us through faith. And the Old Testament saints by faith. By their faith in that sacrifice. Our faith that's given to us through Christ. Amen. And I said, Lord, if I'm going, you got to take me. There's no other way. And that was it. I came out my whole life changed. You see, before, as a religious person, I could go hang out with my old buddies in the bars out in Texas, <clears throat> in the dance halls, and I could sit there and drink Coke. And they say, have a, have a drink, Frank. It's one of the others would pipe up. No, Frank doesn't got religion. He was absolutely right. But you know, when I got saved, I didn't want to be around that anymore. Amen. Things that I used to love like that, I begin to hate. And going to church, I begin to love. I come home, ended up getting off the road. And for four years, I was holding family devotions at night with my biological children and my wife. And every time we went to get into the devotions, it's like my wife would start an argument. And I said, are you saved? You remember, she was the religious one. Four years after I got saved, my wife got saved. 
Religion will mess you up. Religion will mess you up. I grew up with my grandparents and stuff. They were religious. But until you come under Holy Ghost conviction, God deals with you and says, hey, you are a sinner. You're a liar. I think it was Ray Comfort I was listening to, and he said that a friend of his had some parking tickets, and he was going to go to court. They finally caught up with him, and he gets to court, and he figured, I got $700 in my pocket. I'll just pay the tickets. So when the judge said something to him, he said, well, I just paid the tickets. He said, uh, -uh you're going to jail. <laughs> what? For tickets? See, what Ray said was that this friend of his had minimized what sin was. Just didn't pay some tickets. But whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, is guilty of how many? Oh. oh. Now, the Bible says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone you believe in. He trivialized his sin. You know what we do? Well, I, I lie, but so do they. Or, I might do this, but they're worse. What if you come face to face with the Lord when he says, you are a sinner on your way to hell and you need to repent. And if there's no repentance, there's no salvation. Could you imagine? I mean, I had a zeal for God. I painted my truck with a cross. I would tell everybody about Jesus. But I had that other Jesus that Paul talks about, that other gospel that Paul talks about, that other spirit that Paul talks about. But you know what? Before I got saved, months before I got saved, I wanted one of them old Bibles like my grandfather had. I didn't know there was a difference between the King James Bible and all the other garbage out there. But he put a King James Bible in my hand. It's through the preaching of the word of God that people get saved. And you get a right spirit with it. There's a spirit that come with the other ones Paul talks about. That's why he said to try the spirit, see if they be of God. Now in Romans in chapter 10, Paul says here, brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteous and going about to establish their own righteous have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteous to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteous which is of the law that the man that doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteous which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who is, shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The problem with most people today in religion is they got it in the head. They have a head religion. They believe about Jesus in their head. And they miss heaven by about 18 inches because it's not in the heart. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over all, over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now look at verse 13. Here's the verse they like to use to damn a bunch of young kids. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, I can train my parrot to do that. Right. Lord, save me. Right. That'd be funny. Is he saved? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. So they get these little kids when they're young to say, Ask Jesus in your heart. For whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But they don't give them the rest of it. See, look what the rest of it says. 
how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Well, I believe in Jesus. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Amen. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed. The gospel for his eyes say, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went in all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation. I will anger you. So what does he have to preach? He has to preach that you're a sinner. That you've sinned against the holy God. That you're the enemy of God. And that you need to repent. You see, you have to see yourself as that guilty sinner. And when a person sees themselves as that sinner. And they're willing to turn from their sin. Repentance is just a 180 turn. You're going this way away from God. You're headed down... The path of sin. God says, hey, you've sinned against my law. You're on your way to hell. Repent. Come to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. What do you have to believe? That you're a sinner? That there's nothing good about you? You know, we're living in a society today that wants to make everybody good. The Bible says there's none that do with good. No, not one. Who are you going to believe? The word of God. Amen. What a lot of people want to do is they want to take the part in here they like and throw the other part out. And see, when you get saved, you're supposed to have a changed life. You begin to hate the things you once loved that grieve God. And you begin to love the things that you used to hate. Now, when Pope John Paul died, a friend of mine said, hey, preacher, what do you think about the Pope? I said, I think he died and went to hell. <gasps> Part of the Antichrist. He teaches you got to worship idols. And, and the Bible says there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And he says you got to go through the priest. That's two mediators. And you got to go through Mary. That's three mediators. He said, come on, preacher. He, he, he's a, he just believes a little different than you. He's religious. You're absolutely right. Let me ask you something. This is what I asked him. I said, let me ask you something. Do you know the story about Cain and Abel? Didn't uh, Cain kill his brother Abel because he got jealous? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let me ask you something. Did Cain bring a sacrifice to God? Yes, his younger brother. Did he talk to God? Did God talk to him? Yeah. Where did Cain go? Hell. Why? He tortured because he killed his brother. No, because he wouldn't repent and turn to God and offer up that lamb like Abel did. He wanted to worship God, but he wanted to worship God his way. You see, there's a church over in Columbia, and they're worldwide now. It's called the MCC Church. You ever heard of it? It's called the Metropolitan Christian Church. Over at the flea market, there's that, you see that old uh, castle-looking church? It used to be a Baptist church, Metropolitan Baptist Church. But he sold it and got out of it because... They come up with this Metropolitan Christian Church. It was the Sodomites. You know what Sodomites are. All right. God said that they're an abomination. Mm -hmm. Do you know that they cannot reproduce? They have to recruit. See, things that are unnatural can't reproduce, just like the 
tangelo can't reproduce. You got to put an orange and a tangerine seed together to bring and graft the tree together. So things that are unnatural can't reproduce. God never designed it that way. They have a Lutheran pastor that's a sodomite. They were in the gay parades. Every time we were at the gay parades, they'd march down there and they're singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He loves the sinner, but he hates your sin. And you're not going to enter in as long as you're that way. And if you stay that way, you end up reprobate, just like all the others over in Romans chapter 1. So who are you going to believe? You're going to believe the Bible or somebody because they seem to be religious and sing Christian songs? Bible. Exactly. Now, that's a sad state to be in, but there's a lot of Baptists sitting in the Baptist churches the same way. They might not be sodomites, but they're religious and lost. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. The Bible says from such turn away. Let me ask you, was Balaam religious? Huh? Yeah, he was a Gentile prophet. He died lost. How about Corey? You know, Corey was some of the ones that carried the vessels and the furniture in the tabernacle. They were part of the tribe of Levi. But that all of a sudden, he decides he's just as good as Moses. Now, he probably could have been a better preacher than Moses. But God didn't call Corey. He called Moses. Amen. You see, a lot of people think they can just go out and start a church. We got women pastors out here. What's the Bible say about that? Let your women keep silent in the church for the shame for them to speak. He says, let not a woman teach nor usurp authority over a man. Right. Who are you going to believe? The Bible? Or what somebody says? Bible. Thank you. There's some women preacher out there can out preach anybody I know, but they're not called to be bishops and pastors. It's an abomination. It's a shame. They can teach women Sunday school. My wife used to go to the jails. Anytime you find a woman. And I'll tell you a good one, Ellen G. White. You know who she is? She's the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I call them Seventh-day Disadvantaged. <laughs> She's got a book that thick on Bible doctrine that she wrote. They started the Pentecost movement down in Missouri in the 1900s with two women. Straight out of hell. Religious they were, but lost. If you believe that Bible. When people start taking the Bible and taking a little bit here for themselves and throwing this part out, there's something wrong. They're probably not saved. See, we have a birth certificate, 1 John 5, 13. You know what that says? These things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. We got a birth certificate. But what do you believe? You have to believe as the scripture has said. There were three people there, Cain, Balaam, Corey, all religious. All lost. I was religious teaching Sunday school. And you know what the difference was? I started sticking up for the pastor when he was counseling the ladies in the churches that were going through rough times with their husbands. <laughs> if you know what I mean. And I said, well, we ought to forgive them. So I got up in front of 500 people and told them how rotten I was. And about my life, thinking I'd help him. How foolish was that? 
is a pastor. His name was Donnie Delk. I'll say this tonight in closing. You better know what the Bible says and know what you believe. If I had listened to my mom and dad when I was growing up, my mama told me I'd get another chance during the tribulation. If I looked at my dad and watched how he lived, even though he talked about God, he even took us to church for a few years. If I listened to him, he wouldn't have got saved. See, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And I look back at my life. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I went back to New Jersey. I went to work in a chemical plant on a rotating ship. My wife went to work for the same company up on the hill in the office. My uncle worked there. He's superintendent. A place as big as an army base. All kind of divisions. Plus, I had a job with the trucking company that my dad had worked for. Working when I wasn't working over here. I worked three jobs for quite a while to buy my first house. Then I got hooked in with a guy that wanted to get me into Masons over in South Bound Brook. Over in the town I lived in in Bound Brook, I got on the police reserve. I was sitting over there. We're having a party and drinking Boilermakers. Shot of whiskey dropped into a glass of beer and getting all messed up. And I looked and I wanted to be over the road trucker. I was trucking local and I had to testify against the and uh, anyway I moved to Pittsburgh rented the house out bought another place in Pittsburgh and not Pittsburgh actually Uniontown and I got over the road and I went right past one of my best friends churches Aliquip of Baptist Temple Pastor Cunningham the man that gave me these views And never met him. But things happened with my party and my fight and everything. And I ended up down here. Then I got religious. and But I was across the street from Blake Lindsay. Who was going to the Bible school in the church at Gethsemane. And he needed a set of jumper cables one day. And God was dealing me about preaching. And I got with him. Next thing you know I was there. and Almost a year later I got saved. Took that long to get the religion out of me. Mm -hmm. And I look back at my life and the man's church that I used to go by all the time, we became friends because he was a good friend, Pastor Randall. He used to go up there and preach revival for. And I said, Lord, why didn't you just send me to his church when I was up there? And the Lord laid it on my heart that he wasn't, I needed somebody like a Marine Corps drill instructor. Pastor Cunningham wasn't like that. He's a good man, loves God, serves God, soul wins, pass out tracks, everything. But I needed somebody that would tell me the truth and hit me right between the eyes with it. And I look back at my life. If I got into Masonic Lodge, I'd still be shaking hands with funny knuckles and giving it a ring and maha boning. <laughs> But the Lord got me out of all that, the fraternal order of police and all this stuff. And I look back and I see how God, through circumstances that were not the greatest, turned my life and brought me around till he got me down here where I could hear a clear presentation of the gospel. So I thought all churches were the same. I thought all religions were the same. Whether you're run, rubbing... Buddha's belly or bowing to a priest. I thought it was all the same. But then I learned that I have a word of God that God gave to me that I could read in English. And he said if I lacked wisdom, all I had to do was ask him. And he put a spirit within us so we could understand the scripture. So all those things that happened, God was using it to bring me right here. Look back in your life, see where you're at today. See who's directing it. 
You see, God loved me even when I was his enemy. He loved me. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he wanted to see me saved. And he knew what it took to get me. One thing I've learned, I've heard people say, I wish I'd have never got saved. Well, you're an idiot. You're probably not saved. That's why you're saying that. Or I, I thought God, you know, I thought when I got saved, everything was going to be wonderful. That I was never going to have another problem. That's not the case, but I do have somebody to walk with me through those problems. Amen. I'll tell you this story. They've heard it before, but I'm going to tell it to you. I was hauling peaches out of Johnston, South Carolina. I had my refrigerated trailer. I had them check the temperature on it and reset it and make sure everything was right, supposedly. And I rebuilt a truck out here. One I had put an engine in and the rears and everything, and I messed up and I didn't oil the bearings. <laughs> I went down and I loaded a load of peaches going to Baltimore, and I came back here, and uh, I left that evening. I got up 77 there, and I heard something go, Rit! I said, uh-oh, and I pulled over. I welded them bearings together. I called my son. He came up in the morning with the service truck, and we stripped the truck down there and cut the bearings off and put new bearings and everything in. It's hot summer day, load of peaches on, supposed to be at 34 degrees. And I'm sitting there listening to that reefer run, and the guy had just tuned it up and everything, and I'm thinking, man, he did a good job. That thing's just hardly idling. Every once in a while, it would kick up and then idle down. So I sat on the road that whole day, and so then that next night, the day before, that next day, that night, next day I showed up at the warehouse in Baltimore. They said, back it in. I flipped my doors open, and as soon as I opened them up, all I smelled was peaches. I'm not talking about cold, fresh peaches. I'm talking about peaches that have ripened for a couple days. Man, I panicked. I ran up there and flipped that thermostat down to zero. And I backed in and I'm going, oh my goodness, I done bought a load of peaches. And I needed the money because I just put all this money in the truck and everything. And these uh, the guys come out and they looked at him and they said, we got to call an inspector in. Oh my goodness. They take the Lord's name in vain and stuff. They had a picnic table over there. And I went over there and laid on the bench. And I started praying. I said, Lord, you know how important this is to me. And I said, Lord, these people don't care about you. I said, Lord, you know we witness and pass out tracts and try to help people. And I said, but these people just taking your name in vain. They don't care nothing about you. I pray you'd have mercy on me. And I open my Bible to Lamentations chapter 3. Where his mercies are new every morning, his compassions fail not. And all of a sudden, I got this verse, the righteous are bold as a lion. And I got up and I walked over to the desk there and I said, hey, you going to take these things or what? They said, yeah, we'll be right with you. I said, all right. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we're going to take them. I said, oh. <laughs> so they're supposed to give me 20-some pallets back. Five bucks a piece. That's 110 bucks. And they said, we don't have any pallets for you right now. And I'm thinking to myself, get your bills and get out of here. And I said, no, if God's in this, I said, I'll wait. I waited. They finally brought me some pallets. They signed my bills, received in good order, and I pulled out. I got back to South Carolina, turned my paperwork in, load paid me seventeen hundred and some dollars. <clears throat> I called them up after I got home. I said, "You got my check ready?" They said, "We don't know if we can pay you or not." I said, "Why not?" He said, "Then people called down here and said they don't know why in the world they took them peaches." I said, "Did I bring you a signed?" 
bill of lading in good order? They said, yeah. I said, if I'd have brought it back and it said bad or short, who'd have to pay for it? He said, you. I says, well, I brought it back. They signed it, said they got it, received it in good condition, right? Yeah. I said, I want my money. They said, all right, come get your check. Do you know who moved their heart? God. God. But I had to remind them of some things about how they're God haters and everything else. I've had more stories like that I could tell you over the years that God's done for me. And I've let him down so many times, but he's never let me down once. So what does it mean to believe? Well, you have to believe that you're a sinner according to the word of God. That there's no amount of works that can save you. And that the only hope you have is the blood of Jesus Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh, who died on the cross, suffered in hell, and rose again the third day. If you believe that from the heart and trust him to save you, then you have salvation. But if you just have a head knowledge and you just go right on like you always have, then you missed it. Amen? Boy, did we go over my mom, the doctor said that she has a bad infection like never seen before. And uh, make my take two days off of Wow. I'm done. Maybe God spoke to your heart tonight. Maybe you'd uh, like to know for sure that when you die, you'd be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Let him deal with you. Tommy, pray for us, please. Praise Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. Thank you for your love and kindness, your mercy and grace. And just thank you for your word and your salvation, Lord, the salvation we have through Jesus Christ. And thank you for that precious blood. And now, Lord, I just want to just thank you for the ones that can take it here tonight and the ones listening on Facebook, Lord. I pray that, their, that your word, Lord, just touches them and, and they can repent of their sins and forget get back in the will of God, whatever it is that's going on in their lives, people's lives, Lord, I just pray, Lord, you deal with them according to your word, and they get a, 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 a knowledge of what you is the Lord from them. Lord, I want to thank you for you know, everything you've done. In the Holy Spirit's name, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. And by the way, my dad was my best friend. <laughs>